All right, welcome everyone to the first platform backend update of 2018. Uh, my name is Dao Man, as many of you may know, and I am the engineering manager for that platform backend team. Uh, today, I'd like to give you an update on what the team has been up to the last five weeks since the last update and what we plan to be up to uh, in the next until the next update after this one. And then, of course, we'll update you on uh, how well those next five weeks actually went compared to uh, the plans. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I suggest that you post them to the chat. I'll try to take a moment to answer questions at the end of every slide. And at the end, I'll give you about 15 more seconds to ask questions. But uh, if you want to get an answer quick, I suggest you ask quick as well, as you can still see the relevant data on the screen. So. First of all, um, let's talk a little bit about what we've done in the last five weeks. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail for each of these items, but I quickly want to mention uh, on December 22nd, we released GitLab 10.3. We had already finalized development of these features two weeks prior to that on December 7th, uh, but it's great to see these actually get released. And I'd like to specifically call out these four features or three features and a couple of performance improvements. Uh, that you see listed here with links to the issues. And I would like to thank Myra, James Edwards Jones, Tiago, and Fran, and some other people uh, specifically for these contributions. Then on the 7th uh, of January, we finalized development of GitLab 10.4, which I'll get to a little bit in the next couple slides. And then the day afterwards, about two weeks ago to the day, uh, we kicked off development of GitLab 10.5. Last five weeks, we also defined our OKRs for 2018 quarter one, uh, all of which are listed here. Um, you can follow the link to the OKRs to see some more details, and you can follow the links in the slide if you want to read some more as well. Uh, there's a couple of these that I specifically like to call out. Uh, as you can see, close 60 platform backend bug issues. Um, this is one of the goals for this quarter to make a significant dent in the backlog of bugs that we have outstanding. And this is going to be selected in part because of priority and stuff that a lot of our customers are hitting. Thing. And then we're also going, going to try and address some of the uh, longer standing bugs, just little 500 errors or exceptions in some pages in the product that we've technically known about for a while, but we've never really made time to address them. Um, for 10.5, the release we are working on right now, we have 13 of these issues scheduled. This may make it sound like we are way you know, off schedule to hit 60 by the end of the quarter, the quarter having three months, which means that we need to schedule 20 on average per month. Um, we are a little bit below that right now, but that is expected because we also expect to grow in team size over this quarter. So while in 10.5, you might see 13 bucks, in 10.6, you might see 20. And then in 10.7, you may see the remaining uh, 27 as the team grows and as we gain capacity to actually address these bugs. Um, over these months. Uh, then under ship 100% of committed deliverable issues each release, you can see a little square. That square should have been a fingers crossed emoji in case you're wondering. Uh, of course, we won't know how well we actually did on delivering these until the end of the month. And we're gonna do a little retro to see what the percentage is and we're gonna collect this data over the quarter to make sure um, that after the OKR, after the quarter completes, we can see how well we actually did on all of these OKRs. That's it for the OKRs. If you have any more questions, the uh, chat is the place to ask them. Today, uh, we're going to release GitLab 10.4. If you follow that link, you will see that it currently 404s because the blog post isn't actually up yet. But later today, this will be happening. And one of the contributions that Platform made to this is fast SSH key lock lookup in CE. Uh, this is a feature that we had had in Enterprise Edition for a while. And basically what it means is that when you're pushing over SSH to a repo or you're pooling uh, rather, instead of having to do a linear search to a specific text file that lists all of the keys, their fingerprints, and the user they map to, which is kind of the old approach and the approach that CE up until now is always used. Um, we are going to do this with a quick 01 um, database lookup now, rather than having it be a linear search through this file that grows ex every time someone uploads an SSH key into GitLab. Uh, you might be wondering why did we only contribute one issue or one feature to GitLab 10.4? Uh, well, one reason, of course, is that the development month for this release uh, took place from December 7th until January 7th, which included the holidays. And during this week between Christmas and New years, a lot of people ended up taking off. So we were a little bit limited in our capacity because of that. And the other thing that contributes to this relatively low output for 10.4 is that during the development month that I just mentioned, uh, we had a couple people working on really big features that would take more than one month to complete. They were doing some investigative work during the fourth month and only actually um, you know, writing code that would be shippable during the month following it, which is the current month. So in 10.5, we'll be seeing some of this labor uh, payoff that already happened during 10.4, but that of course means that significant resources during the 10.4 development month were not actually put 
in stuff that would go into 10.4 itself. Uh, we were, of course, able to con uh, include a couple of bug fixes as well in 10.4. And if you follow that link, you'll see those and some of the other things we did for 10.4. Of course, 10.4 itself is going to contain a lot more stuff than just this one issue uh, because there's a lot of teams in GitLab that contributed to it. But this is the biggest thing coming from platform backend. So then let's look at the next five weeks. And as you can see from the list here, this is going to be a little bit more interesting than what we contributed to 10.4. Uh, on the 7th, which is in about two weeks, we're going to contribute. Uh, we're going to finalize development of 10.5. And then two weeks after that, it will be released. Um, group level SAML single sign-on is one of these things that we started on during 10.4. Uh, and this is the first iteration toward having SAML single sign-on on a per group basis on gitlab.com, which of course is a much requested feature for enterprises or companies that have their own SAML instance or their kind of um, secondary authentication system to be able to use this with gitlab.com rather than having them have to run their on-premises GitLab installation and have that connect to SAML on an instance-wide basis. And we're going to allow this on a group level. Um, the first iteration that's going to ship into 10.5 will not quite be feature complete yet. It will be behind a feature flag that you can enable using a cookie. Um, but the first work will be merged into GitLab during this month. And then over in a few months, hopefully, we'll be able to present the entire feature for you, uh, which will be per group SAML single sign-on on, on GitLab.com. The second one, external policy classification control, was also one of these really big efforts that uh, we started on last month, but that won't actually have anything merged into GitLab until this month, month 10.5. Um, and like I just discussed last time, this is a feature that will allow certain companies in regulations where in, in, in industries where there are really tight regulations about access to certain resources, it will allow them to go beyond what GitLab provides in terms of access control and have every click into a project or every click into an issue of a project call out to an external service to verify that the user actually has access to this resource. Um, and a lot of this is not just implementing the functionality, but also making sure that when we are developing features in the future going forward, that we don't forget to um, build these checks into the right places because otherwise, of course, we would either end up with a feature that wouldn't work at all in this when this feature is enabled, or we would end up with a feature that accidentally leaks information in this environment without going to this external um, external endpoint to check access. So the feature itself is almost feature complete. Now we're also almost now we're just working uh, not just, but we are spending a lot of time making sure that this will not make development harder going forward. Because, of course, it is quite intrusive to the code base, uh, and it will only be enabled for a small percentage of, of customers. So it will be hard for us to find out whether or not a feature we build works or doesn't work correctly in it, except uh, unless we do very specific testing. And of course, we don't want to end up hearing from the customer when we broke something. We want to be ahead of that news. The third thing um, is going to be implementing Git LFS file locking API. Uh, Git LFS 2.x, which last launched a while ago, 2.0, which launched a while ago, allows file locking through the command line interface uh, if you have Git LFS enabled, so that you can have exclusive access to a certain file for you know a certain period of time to make sure no one overwrites your changes that you're making. Uh, we've had file locking in GitLab Enterprise Edition for a while. Uh, this was a feature that you would enable in the in the interface. Um, you would browse to a blob through GitLab, and you would hit the little lock button, and then you would acquire a lock on it, and then later on you would need to remember to unlock it. Um, and Git LFS provides the same functionality in the form of a command line interface. So that means that we are going to enable the git LFS command line option uh, of locking files in CE. And then in EE, we're still going to get the GitLab UI around this. But it will use the same backend, which means that if you lock a file using the LFS command line, it will show up inside GitLab as a locked file. And then if you unlock it from the GitLab interface, it will also be unlocked um, from LFS's perspective. I see that John may ask the question, will that check be for CEEEEEEEU? Um, were you referring to external policy classification control or something else, John? If you can clarify, I'm happy to respond in a moment. And until then, I'll move on to the next item on the list. Push to create a new project is a really cool feature that has been on the, in the bug tracker for a while that we finally made some time for. The idea is that if you push to a Git URL, either over SSH or HTTP, that doesn't point to an actual repository that exists, we will automatically create that 
project for you uh, if you're pushing into your personal namespace, which means gitlab.com slash your username slash some project.git. We will automatically create that project in the, on the background, uh, which means that if you're starting out a new project locally in your editor or in your terminal, instead of having to then go to GitLab and create the project, acquire the push URL, et cetera, uh, you can just skip that whole step of explicitly creating the project and have this happen automatically the moment you're pushing to the repository which is going to be really cool because it removes some friction from uh, getting started with a new project. The next thing, proper LFS support when uploading a file to the web interface. This was already planned for 10.4. We didn't manage to complete it then, but for 10.5, we're going to tackle this. Uh, we're going to attempt to tackle this again, and hopefully we will uh, fit it in this time. Uh, the next one is ability to transfer a single group to another group. We've had subgroups for a while, as most of you, uh, I'm sure, are aware. But uh, And we also support transferring a project from one group to another or from someone's personal namespace to another group. But we don't specifically support moving an existing group into another existing group as a subgroup yet. Uh, this was actually a feature that Myra worked on in her tech interview when she was a technical interview as part of her uh, interviewing process uh, when she was applying to GitLab as a developer. And Myra also um, you know, opened up some time to finish this merge request that she had started then. And it's going to be a very nice feature that's going to make it easier for users to migrate to a subgroup-based sub workflow uh, instead of having multiple groups all at the root level. A nice thing about subgroups, one of the nice things is that you can have um, access flow down. So if you add someone to the main GitLab organization, for example, they will automatically gain the same level of access to GitLab slash development, GitLab slash marketing, etc. As you can imagine, this is uh, applicable to a lot of company organizational structures, uh, and it will simplify access control, it will simplify sharing and that kind of stuff. Uh, I see that John clarified, checking to see if that person should have exited every click. It looks like EE, but I want to know if it's EES, EEP, or EEU. Um, I think it's going to be EEP. I hope that Mike Bartlett is in the chat because he will be able to clarify. Yeah, exactly. It will be premium. Oh, yeah. I guess we're not calling it EEP anymore. It's just premium now. But that will be announced in the team call in about 20 minutes. So until then, I'm still going to do it wrong. Sorry about that. Uh, so, yeah, premium. Um, next, integration test for backup restoring GitLab QA. We've had this really cool project called GitLab QA for a little bit. Uh, and what it does is it allows you to do kind of integration testing, not just of the Rails application that is GitLab, but the entire virtual machine that you get when you install an Omnibus package. That means you've got your Postgres, you've got your, 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 you know, the main GitLab application. But that means you can also test these kind of things that require an actual VM to be running and verify that these are working as expected. So for example, you could back up and you could create a backup for an ex, uh, for a complete GitLab VM with everything on it, the data in the repositories and the data in the database. You could create this backup and then restore the backup and then verify that the VM you end up with after the restore does indeed have the same data inside it that the VM that did that you started with. This is kind of hard if you're testing contained to GitLab uh, to Rails integration tests because then you can really only uh, mimic requests and make sure that the request returns the stuff that you're expecting. But if you actually want to do stuff against the whole VM, that's something that GitLab QA enables you to do. Uh, of course, we do have backup restore integration tests inside GitLab Rails already. But if something somewhere goes wrong in omnibus configuration, for example, or in setting up the VM, we currently don't have a way to catch that. Uh, and these GitLab QA tests will uh, enable us to be ahead of those kinds of mistakes. Um, and we have a lot of other stuff for GitLab QA planned. And I know that a lot of the teams are adding stuff to GitLab QA. And this is going to be platform backend's first contribution to make sure that backup restore will never end up breaking um, in some way that we couldn't already catch using Rails integration tests. Of course, there's a lot more that we are working on this month. And if you follow that little more link, you'll be linked to our issue tracker where we are tracking uh, all of those issues. If you have any specific questions about any of these issues, I suggest going into the issue itself and asking there. Or, of course, adding it in the chat uh, while we're still here. Another thing that the platform backend team uh, will be working on in the next five weeks is automatically billing newly added users on GitLab.com. Uh, not every one of you may be aware that one of the responsibilities of the platform team is not just the platform base, the platform functionality inside the GitLab application, but also uh, some of the applications that we use internally to, for example, allow users to pay for GitLab.com subscriptions. Uh, the customer app is one of these. And one of the things that we are adding to this during this uh, upcoming five weeks and that we have been working on for the last two weeks is the ability to automatically build newly added users on GitLab.com. This means that if you have a group which starts out with 10 people when you uh, you know create your GitLab.com subscription and then you add five people over the course of the month, that means that the next month we will automatically be billing you for those extra five 
um, users. And I think we'll also be retroactively applying, you know, if they were added halfway through the month, we will retroactively build them half a month of subscription for those five users. Uh, this is not something we had before, then we would need to uh, explicitly up the number uh, in our backend system, but now this will be automatic as well. Uh, so that's what we're going to happen during the five months and then after, uh, during the next five weeks. And then at the end of it, we are going to kick off development of GitLab 10.6 on February 8th. Um, as you might know, may know by now, we usually only decide what's going to go into a release a few days ahead of that, February 8th. So if you want to know what's going to be in GitLab 10.6, I suggest that you join the public kickoff, which will take place on that February 8th. And hopefully by then, I'm pretty sure by then, we'll know exactly what's going to be in 10.6. Uh, that's everything I had for prepared for today. If anyone has any questions, I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to enter those into the chat. And if nothing shows up, then I wish you a great rest of your days uh, if you are a GitLab. And if you're not a GitLab, then I wish you uh, a great rest of your day whenever you end up viewing this through the blog. Thanks for your attention, everyone. I think the uh, 10 seconds are over by now. And have a great rest of your days. And I'll see a lot of you in the team call in a few moments.